Let's get started. Welcome everybody welcome. to Name TV, but welcome. And uh, it's really awesome to see all the new faces here. Hey there in the back. Everybody that doesn't usually come. Um, yeah, so we're gonna get started with a few songs. Let's all stand.
and bowls in Revelation, you know, in the end time, because this is much more fun, and it's practical, and it goes along with this theme about God taking care of us as our Father. Now, first of all, I want to do a couple of things, okay? First of all, um, I would like to invite all of those people in the back. You are far too far away from me, okay? So I would like you all and, and for those of you up here, you guys are awesome because you, you know, you get bonus points, right? You get, huh? In the front. You're in the front because you are the smartest of all, okay? So, can you guys, do, I, I hate, I mean, you feel so far away. I feel so lonely. Come on up here. Join the party. Come on up here. And we've got, we've got free gifts, right? We've got free gifts for those people who will come on up, Okay. All right, let's see. 
We have got, you know, we, we do crazy things. Um, I, I, don't have, I don't have a church that I go to every week. You know, I, we go to different churches. And so we do crazy things, things that will help us, help people be a good witness, be a good testimony for Jesus Christ. This is something, what size did you give me? Do we even know? I don't know. Okay. This is a little t-shirt that we have come up with. And on the back, okay, who can read? Who can read Chinese? Can I? Yes. What does that say? Yeah, very good. Francis, very good. This says, you know, this is this is dialogue, okay? And if you've ever watched a Chinese gangster movie, you know what a dialogue is, okay? And dialogue, of course, means literally big brother, but of course, it is also the leader of your gang, okay? And Jesus Christ is, you know what, theologically speaking, he really is, he really is our dialogue. He really is. He really is. He is, spiritually speaking, he is, the Bible says, the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. We all grow up to be like Jesus. And he is our life leader. He calls the shots. He leads not our game, but he leads our family. Right? So, anyway, what size is this, honey? Large, medium or large? Large, okay. I got a large. Who wears large? Who wears large? Who wears large here? Okay. I'm just going to throw this out there. And whoever gets it, gets it, okay? Here we go. Whoa! Oh! <laughs>
recent college grads or about to be college grads. Good. How many people are working full time? Very good. How many people are married? Wow. Okay. How many people have kids? You have kids already? Ah, you're still in junior high, right? Ah, right? All right. Okay, good. All right. Those of us who are already married or already with kids, too late, okay? <laughs> don't try, don't try these things now, okay? There are no mulligans, <laughs> okay? You can't, I'm sorry, you know, but, but, but there's hope you can still have a good marriage, all right? I want to tell you, I want to tell you, I'm going to share these things, not just from the Word of God. I want to share these things also from personal experience. Why? Because I'll tell you, I got married very late. I got married late in life. And so what does that mean? That means I spent most of my life as a single person. That's right. I spent most of my life, you know, hmm, should I go out to eat? I want to go out to eat, but I don't want to get a table for one. Oh my gosh. So, you know, I spent most of, you know, my, my life, you know, hmm, it's Valentine's Day. Gee, you know, what am I going to do, right? I, so, and I spent a long, long time saying, God, when are you going to provide for me a wife? When are you going to provide for me a family? All right? I share this with you because I want you to know this is not just theory. Okay? I've also practiced this. For the vast majority of my life, I practiced this, and you know what? I'm here to tell you it pays off. It's a good thing. Okay? I want to introduce my family. Oh, praise God. Okay? I want to introduce my family to you. Honey, can you stand? Uh, uh, Micah, can you stand? Oh, he's already standing up. He's not that tall yet. Come out of here, Mikey. Come on. Come on out of here. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. You'll go back to the video game later. Okay, here <laughs> we go. This starts so young, right? Okay, this is my wife, Lillian. And this is Josephine. We call her Jojo. She is, don't get her mad. She is, she'll bite your finger off. And this, this is Micah. This is my boy. He's two and a half, and I think he's the most handsome man in the face, on the face of the earth. Okay, why I'm so happy. God has blessed me, all right? And I, I mean, you can tell, wow, she could do a whole lot better, right? <laughs> right? Come on, be honest, Jackie, you can be honest. You were looking like, you were like, girl, what are you thinking? <laughs> no, 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 I'm just joking. But, but she can do a whole lot better. Yes, she can, all right? But God really, I had to wait a long time. I had to wait a long time, but they're worth it, okay? So, I want to share this exciting message. Okay, go with mommy. Go with mommy. You, no, okay, son, son, son I, daddy needs to talk to the nice people here. Okay? So, so you, you're far too good looking. No one's going to look at daddy. So you, you need to go back. Can you go back, please? Go back. Okay. We'll get me nuggets or whatever later. <laughs> no, chicken tenders. Chicken tenders. Huh? Chicken tenders. Chicken tenders. Chicken tenders. We'll, we'll get you. We'll hook you up with the chicken, with the chicken tenders, okay? There you go. Oh, 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 okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So, today we're going to talk about how to get God to get you the food. Let's read. Let's read. Please put your f smartphones away. All right? You don't need them. I've got all the Bible verses printed out in your outline, and they're up here on the screen, okay? So, just stay with us. The Lord God said, okay, let's read together. The Lord God said, it is not good for what? For the man to be alone. He makes this incredible, beautiful, awesome garden. In a world where Adam did not even have to sweat to make a living, everything was an exercise in pure creativity, the ground was so fruitful, it is said that the Garden of Eden was so fruitful, so fertile, that you could take a stick and just put it in the ground and 
it would just become a tree. It was great. And God puts Adam in paradise. But you know what? Paradise is not what it seems. Because Adam is what? He is alone. You ever go to a beautiful place? You ever go like on a mountaintop? You ever go to an awesome restaurant? You ever go to a, this wonderful place? And you're like, oh, gee, I'm here alone. It's so gorgeous. I'm so thankful, but something's missing. If I only had what? Someone else to share it with, right? So, God sticks at it in this pristine, gorgeous place. More beautiful than any place on earth today, right? Because at that time, this was before the fall. At that time, everything was perfect. At that time, everything was not touched by the effects of sin. And so everything was in absolute perfection. But he was alone. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the wild animals and the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Let's look at a few things. What are some principles we can derive from this narrative? Well, number one, God knows our needs better than you do. God knows our needs before we do. God pronounced it first. Who was it that said it is not good for man to be alone? Did Adam put in a request? Did Adam put a little note in God's suggestion box? Did he say, oh God, this is a really beautiful place, but um, I, I, I got a little suggestion to make. No. God is the one the way Moses writes down this narrative, God is the one who recognizes the problem, recognizes the need, and takes personal initiative to meet that need. Does that make sense? What does that mean? God wants to hook you up. Did you know that? God is interested in your well-being. And part of that well-being for the vast majority of people is that you will have a partner. Now, this is not for everyone. There are those people with very special gift of singleness, and they don't need to be married. They really don't. In fact, it kind of cramps their style. In fact, it kind of gets in the way. In fact, they're more productive as a single. But you know what? Most of us are not. I'll be honest with you. Most of us are not. We're more productive. We function better, what? With someone. Okay? God knows that. And so what are we, what can, what kind of comfort does a young adult, what kind of comfort does a professional, what kind of comfort does a recent grad gain from this? You know what? You don't have to go clubbing. I always thought that was a weird word. Where are you guys going tonight? Oh, we're going clubbing. Yeah. You know, it's like, clubbing? Oh, yeah. You know, it sounds like, you know, something kind of medieval, you know, right? Some people walking around with big old bats going, <laughs> right? You know, go clubbing. Sounds very painful. No, you don't have to go clubbing. You don't have to go to dive bars. You don't have to, you know what? Because God is interested in your relationships. And God wants the best for you, and that includes what? That includes relationships. It is not good. Number two, God will take personal responsibility to help you find his match. Who was it in the biblical narrative? Who was it that took the first step? Was it Adam? Did he go online? Did he go clubbing? Did he get set up on a date? Did he, what did he, no. 
God was the first one to make the first move. I will get involved in Adam's love life. Yeah. I will make a helper suitable for him. God wants to find you a match. Not just any match, but a wonderful, divinely appointed match. Number three, God needs... Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned this before. You, everybody has an outline, right? It's kind of late. I should have said that in the first place. Everybody has an outline, has a pen. You do not? Um, where, Francis, uh, do you have any more? Thank you. Thank you. If you don't have an outline, I should have mentioned this before. Please raise your hand. Francis will get you one. We have them made. We have the technology. They are provided for you. Please take this home with you, okay? Take this home with you, fill in the blanks. God needs you and me to get busy with his plan for you. We need to practice God's will. And you say, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. This sounds very manipulative, okay? The next thing you're going to tell me is that, Tim, you're going to say, give to your church. Give lots of money to your church, and then God will... You know, depending on how much money you give, you know, he will provide you the trophy wife or the not so trophy. No, look at this. The Lord God had done one. The Lord God had made all these animals and birds and cre creepy crawlies and all these things. And what did he do? He gave Adam a what? A job. And what was Adam's job? Now, notice, Adam's job was not cleaning toilets or digging ditches. Adam's job had significance and changed his world. You see that? Adam's job was not busy work. Don't you hate it when your boss gives you busy work? Don't you hate it when your, your, your uh, professor gives you busy work? Is anybody really going to benefit from this and yet I got to do it? Does God give Adam busy work? No. This is real work. It has lasting results, and it changes his world. These animals had no name. By naming them, God will say, you will rule over them. You see this? In ancient times, the king had the ability to name you or rename you anything he wanted. Your parents named they're children, right? The mom and dad get the privilege and prerogative of naming the baby. And what God was saying was, Adam, you the man. You're in charge. All of these animals are under your stewardship. You will take care of them. They will be subject to you. Not to me. I'm not going to micromanage you. I'm going to give you a real job, and when you name them, that's it, baby. Whatever you name that thing, that's its name. Isn't that cool? God does not give us busy work. God gives us world-impacting, life-changing destinies. And as Adam was doing what God called him to do, what did he notice? What did he notice? Well, there is a Mr. Tiger and a Mrs. Tiger. Hmm. There is a Mr. Giraffe and a Mrs. Giraffe. There is Mr. Adam and Mrs. Orangutan? Ooh, no, no, right? He noticed that there was a pattern there was a pattern that these two are very much alike, yet not identical. Alike, not identical. They complement one another. They look good together, but they are different. Ah, oh, there's this pattern. Mr. Dog, Mrs. Dog. Right? Mr. Elephant, Mrs. Elephant. There's a pattern here. Mr. Adam, what? There was no suitable what? Match. 
There was no suitable helper. All the animals had helpers, but Adam was alone. You see, only when we do God's work do we realize some things. Number one, we realize our uniqueness. We realize our personality. We realize our strengths. We realize our passion. We realize the things we like to do, the things we don't like to do, the things we're gifted in, the things we're not gifted in. It is only when we do the work that God has called us to do that we discover who we are. And until you and I discover who we are, how can we recognize God's match for us? You see it? You see, you, you see it's, a, it's a very simple thing. Also, you know what? When we do God's work, God works in us. When we do God's work, God works in us. He makes us a better what? A better person. He makes us more patient. He makes us more loving. He makes us more forgiving. He makes us more understanding. He makes us all these good things. And those of you who have been married for a while, you will know and you will tell the rest of us what? That marriage is work. And what is that which makes a good marriage? Being patient, being forgiving, being understanding. Right? Laying down our needs and our wants for the other person. The idea is that we are obsessed with finding the right person. And that is wrong. That is absolutely the wrong focus. Instead, we should think about becoming the right person. You understand? So in other words, everyone, all the guys are looking for what? Miss Right. All the women are looking for what? Mr. Right. And so, what happens? Well, if there is, let's say, a hundred single people here, all 95% of the girls, of the ladies, are going to be looking at 5% of the guys, right? Because right? the top 5% of the guys, those are the like alpha dogs, and those are the guys who are tall and good looking and handsome, those are the guys who have hair, okay? And those are the ones that are going to be wow in demand. Vice versa. If there's a hundred people or a thousand people, doesn't matter, okay? There's going to be 5% of the girls on top of here, of the ladies on top of here, all the guys, and the guys are especially bad at this, all the guys are going to be like gunning for, dreaming about, hoping for, what? That upper crust, that upper 5%. And we call this social Darwinism. We say, oh, this is just the way it is. You know what? That is not the way. That's a bunch of baloney. You know why? Because that is a purely objective meat market way of looking at things. And so, of course, yeah, all the hoi poi, all the rest of us, we're going to be gunning for that time. And all the rest of us here are going to be looking at, you know what? That's people looking for objectively the right person. Who is the right person? Well, the person that is makes more money, the person that's taller, the person that's better looking, the person that has, you know, blah, blah, this and that. That is a terrible way, inefficient, unrealistic, corrupt way of looking at things. God says, you have a match. And that match, I am preparing for you. And that person will be tuned into you, you as an individual. See? In our day, we have no problems saying everybody's an individual. Well, if everyone is such an individual, then the person that is right for you cannot possibly be right for me. Does that make sense? Right? Makes sense, right? And so for all of us to get all bent out of shape, you know, and say things, and I know single people say this, all the good ones are what? Already what? All the good men are already what? Taken. Or gay. 
right? All of the good ones, right? Do you say that? Oh man, all the good ones are gay. Okay. That's another subject. We'll talk about that later. But you understand? Instead of looking for Mr. Right, we should think about becoming Mr. Right. Instead of looking for Miss Right, we should become Miss Right. Instead of looking for the right person, we should invest our lives in becoming the right person. And is God an ogre? Is he a manipulated ogre to make you serve and work for his own benefit? No. I mean, God has angels, he has miracles, he has miraculous power. I mean, there's a million things. He doesn't really need any of us to do his work. You follow me? He really does it. But in doing God's work, I get better. Yeah? And I know myself better. And then I'm able to recognize the good stuff. Yeah? I'm able to recognize that one is right for me. Okay? But until you know yourself, until you understand yourself, until you've done enough work in God's kingdom that I know what I'm blessed in, I know what I'm gifted in, I know what my passion is, I know what my destiny is with the Lord, you have no you have not enough information to evaluate clearly. Does that make sense? And so I really, I mean, all of you are very much dateable age, okay? But I tell sometimes that when I, when I speak to junior highs, I speak to high schoolers. Oh, they're so, you know, ready. Oh, you know, I want to date. I'm, you know, so... May I say the word? I don't want to be crude, but you know, they're so horny, right? And so it's like, oh man, I just want to get out there. Want to... But you know what? They have no idea who they are, right? They have no clue who they really are. How can they possibly know their match? Does that make sense? Right? Cool. Even God cannot steer. A park, car. Right. Even God cannot steer a parked car. What, 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 what are we talking about here? If you sit in your room and say, Oh God, I need a mate. Please provide me a mate. <laughs> and I will not leave my room until you provide me a mate. This is not faith. That's not faith. That's laziness, cowardice, lack of faith. Get your car moving, and God can steer you to the right person. Does that make sense? I'll give you a true story. True, 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 true story, okay? Really happened. All right? Really happened. I knew a guy. He was, he came from the Bay Area, and he was an oncologist, a cancer doctor. Wow. Cancer doctor. The big bucks. Smart. Right? He's smart, tall, tall guy. Good looking guy, had all his hair. Okay. As you can tell, I'm obsessed with hair. Okay? <laughs> and the lack of <laughs> He was had a full head of hair. Reasonably good looking. Big money. Smart. That means chances are good, he'd be good, smart children, right? Provide all your needs. He went to Bible school. That's where I met him. I met him at Bible school. And you know what? The guy was single. One day we were talking and I said, well, what do you want to do when you finish here? He says, I want to go serve AIDS patients and people with cancer in Kenya. I want to go to Kenya to be a missionary doctor. And I thought, wow, this guy is really cool. I mean, not only he's smart, not only he's got money, not only he's, you know, tall and got a full head of hair, and, but he also has a good heart. I was like, wow, this guy's a catch. But he said, you know what, but you know what, Tim, I'm single. And I don't 
really want to face the pressures of being a missionary alone. That, that's realistic, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's realistic. And so I'm torn. I don't know what to do. Should I wait until God provides me a wife before I go, or should I just go? But if I go, it's going to be all the more harder to find someone, right? And I said, oh, I don't know, bro. That's a tough one. Let's pray about it. And we prayed about it. Okay? Time goes on. A few months later, finish our program. Haven't heard from the guy. Then one day, I get an announcement in my letterbox. And it was what? Him announcing his wedding. You know what happened? Do you know what happened? He decided, you know what, God? I am going to put my faith and my trust in you, and I am just going to go. You have called me to go to Africa to be a doctor for you there. I'm going to do it. Whether or not you provide me with someone, and I'm going to just trust you that you know my needs. And he went ahead and did it. And you know what? The very last minute, when he is in orientation, getting ready by his agency to go overseas, they take him to Tacoma, Washington. And in Tacoma, Washington, at the very last minute, who should he meet and fall madly crazy, head over heels in love with? This woman who's a midwife from Germany. Wow. And they knew they were right for each other. And I got a wedding invitation. Oh, not invitation, but a wedding announcement that they were getting married. Imagine that. God was hooking them up. And he took a Bay Area guy up to Portland, then over to Tacoma. Meanwhile, he took a woman from Germany all the way over to Tacoma, Washington, so they could meet. Now, if either of them had been like that parked car, huh, right? If either of them had been like that parked car, God, I'm not going to move here until you give me what I want. Could they have ever met each other? Of course not. So God wants us at work in his kingdom. And it's not for his benefit, but it's for our benefit. As we work in his kingdom, we become better people. Like I said, more patient, more kind, more generous, more thoughtful, right? Also, we move physically, geographically. We learn about ourselves and about other people and how to live and work with them. And he gets us where we need to be to find our match. You see that? God has a plan. But if you and I don't jump in, we don't get to be part of the plan. Does it make sense? Right? We don't get to be part of it. It's an active plan. What do we discover about ourselves? When we do what God calls or provides us to do, well, one thing, we understand our personality. If you have a relationship, if you are married, if you have had a boyfriend or a girlfriend in the past, you know fights are inevitable. Disagreements are inevitable. Why? Because people have different personality types. And when we discover our personality types and other people's personality types, guess what? We understand how to live with other people. And that's very important. Our temperament, right? Am I a task-oriented person? Am I a quiet person? Am I an introverted person? And I'm an extroverted person. How do I like to work? Do I, am I a big picture person or am I a detailed person? You see? We need to find out about all these things because all these things are important information to know, right? Talent. Talent. God has enabled 
each and every one of his children with talents. Some of your talents you don't know yet. Some of your talents you won't discover. Rick Warren talks about this one woman who discovered she was great at running marathons. Yeah, marathons, 26 and a half mile marathon. You know how old she was when she ran her first marathon? Not 16, not 26. She was 70. 70, right? If you're 70, you're like, don't run a marathon. Don't even put on tennis shoes. You're going to die, right? <laughs> there are new talents. There are hidden talents. You don't know all their talents. You don't know. There could be some wonderful talents that you have yet to discover. Your passion. How can you get married if you don't even know your passion? Right? Passion is what makes you tick. Passion is what you get up in the morning and you say, I don't care if I'm paid or not. I am put on this earth to do this. I would pay money to do this. That's your passion. And if you don't know your passion, how can you possibly have a serious dating relationship? In a serious marriage? Because your passion cannot conflict with her passion, right? Makes sense, right? How could you? You will always be fighting. You have to be a team. You have to complement one another. And so you should know your passion. The other person should know their passion and your destiny, your direction. Why am I here. Of course, we can be very generic. Oh, I'm here to glorify God. I'm here to make the world a better place. You know, we can say something very generic. But that's not enough. You know, down deep in your heart, you don't want to be that generic. Right? You want to have a, a specialty. You want to have a focus. You want, you want to know, for this I was born. Isn't that an awesome feeling? So there's all these wonderful things to discover about ourselves when we do God's work. God enjoys taking the initiative to provide for our needs, including a mate. You know the story, right? When Adam was asleep, God took one of his ribs, he fashioned a woman, and he what? He brought her to God. Interesting. Is this a fairy tale? Is this a myth? Is this just a, a literary device? It's very interesting that Moses wrote down the rib. Why a rib? Why not an eyebrow? Why not a foot? Why not a heart? Why a rib? It is a medical fact that when surgeons take bone grafts, where do they go? Do you know? Anyone, anyone, oh, uh, search in here? Anyone? You, you? No? <laughs> Why rib? You know they take ribs, even today? Even today they take ribs, why? Because there is something around the rib that regenerates. If you were to take my leg bone, a fibia, a tibia, an ankle, and take it out, it's not going to grow back. But you know what happens? If you're very careful and you know what you're doing, and you take the rib out, you know what happens? The rib grows back. Did God happen to know that? Did Moses make this up and just happen to say rib when he meant spleen? Or did Moses really know the truth? That God really did take the rib. Because why? Because when Adam died, he had all his ribs back. Yeah? Because the rib grows back. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, God brought her to the man. Did Adam have to chase after the woman? Did he? No, oh, smart girl. Did Adam have to go clubbing? Did Adam 
even have to get on an online you know, dating service. No. Did Adam have to wash and wax his car? Okay, right? All of the things that we do today to impress the opposite sex. Did Adam have to do any of those? What did he have to do? Take a nap? No, no, no. <laughs> he took a nap after he did God's work. He did God's work. And then God brought her to the man. How did my friend, the cancer doctor, meet the love of his life? While preparing to go on missions. How did I meet my wife that could have done so much better? She could get someone younger. She could definitely get someone richer. She could get someone taller. She could get someone more handsome. But she got me. <laughs> Poor thing. No. no. We were doing God's work together. We met on a worship team. You see, I bet you a lot of you have stories like that. That you can share with the young people. Say, oh yeah, that happened to me and the missus too. That, you know what? Give God a try. Let God get the hookups for you. We need to prepare. prepare. Now what's our responsibility? Okay? You say, oh, Tim, okay, that's all great. Sounds like that's all God's responsibility. Is there anything for me to do? Yes, there is. God would say, oh, most certainly there is. God would say, you, me, we need to prepare to be married. You say, well, I, I, I'm married. I just, I just want someone to buy me dinner on a Friday night. You know? <laughs> no, God doesn't want you dating around just to date around. God wants you to date so you can get married because that is what he, he doesn't waste time. Right? He wants to play for kids. He wants the best for you. And what does Moses say? Moses says here, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is you united to his wife, and they become one flesh. What is Moses saying here? Moses is saying, you need to be ready. You need to line up your ducks. You need to be financially ready. You need to be emotionally ready. You need to be psychologically ready. You need to be somewhat ready to be autonomous from your parents and establish a new household. That is part of our preparation. And what does this mean? This means deal with your baggage. There's a show, right? Baggage. Hmm. Have some of you seen it? You know what I'm talking about? There's this dating show where they get really dysfunctional people, okay? With lots of baggage and problems. And they reveal a piece at a time to see if they still want to go out with each other, all right? And it's kind of fun because you see you watch it and you're like, oh man, this person is really messed up. Okay, don't choose him. Okay, choose the other guy. And so, it's called baggage. But you know what? I believe that God wants us to deal with our baggage before we get hooked up. Do you understand? Deal with your baggage as much as you can before you get hooked up. Don't still be dependent on mom and dad. Because then you won't be ready to establish your new household. You want to come into this new relationship as mature as you possibly can. Of course we all have to grow all of our lives. But sometimes people get hooked up because of their baggage. What do I mean? A lot of times we see a person of the opposite sex as a savior, as a life preserver. You know what I'm saying? As a way out. I don't like myself. And here I find someone that makes me feel good about myself. I'm going to latch onto this person. You see what I mean? I don't like my situation, my living situation. I find someone who offers me a way out of my current living situation. Bonus. You understand? 
I have baggage. And I find someone that either hides my baggage, makes up for my baggage, or de distracts people from my baggage, and I'm going to clutch onto this person. Right? That's sick. And you're just shooting holes in the boat of your relationship. That's stuff that you're going to have to pay a marriage and family therapist to clean up years, years on down the road. If you make it that far. Be ready. It's good to be single. It's good to be single. Because then you and I get to grow up and be a real grown up as a single person before we go and try to live with another person. Okay? A friend of mine put it this way. How can I live with someone else if I haven't learned to live with myself? How can I live with someone else if I haven't learned to live with myself? And lastly, our goal in dating is to be married in purity without shame. Okay, now, biblical marriage, biblical dating, and secular dating. In the world, what's the purpose for dating? Well, allow me again to be a little crude. The purpose of dating from a secular standpoint is for men to sow their wild oats. And that's just a euphemism to say, have as much sex as you possibly can. Go as far as you possibly can. So that you have all of your wild, libido chasing, expressing, you know, youthful, indiscretions out of the way, out of your system, and then you can settle down with the best that you could do. Okay. Secular dating is a way to at least temporarily fill the loneliness. I don't like being alone. We are all made to be social creatures, right? We are all made to be relational creatures. And so, yes, you know, we want to be with someone. And it's tough being alone. And so sometimes we will play at sex. Women are, are, are more so than men will often play at sex in order to get love. In other words, the main thing about the relationship is not sex. For a woman, the main thing is to be loved, to be nurtured, to be cherished, to be cared for, to be protected, to be unconditionally accepted. And in order to get that, sometimes ladies and girls will give sexual favors in order to keep their man and to feel loved. Well, there's a lot of danger there. There's a whole lot of attraction and that's good, that's godly, that's God-designed, and it's wonderful. But when we date a lot, and when we date too long, you have to be careful. If we date according to the philosophy of the world, we will go too far. We will engage in sexual activity, whether it's promiscuous sex, all the way sex, or it's some form of sexual expression. And what happens is it creates difficulty in the marriage relationship. When we finally settle down, it does not help us. In fact, it makes it harder. You know, the philosophy of the world is that you should live together. You should have sex. You should live together because that's practice. And if you are successful in living together, then maybe you should be married. It's exactly the opposite. A lot of times, people, they live together fine, and once they get married, 
Oh, they can't stand each other. Why is this? Adam and his wife were both naked, and look at what the Bible says, and felt no shame. Physical intimacy before marriage has some dangers. Let's look at these quickly. It unjustly fuses two people's hearts together. Physical intimacy gratify can weaken the intimacy and the trust of the marriage commitment. How does this work? Well, number one, it's, a not, it's not a good thing to fuse your hearts together if you're not married. And until you put a ring on it, right? until you put a ring on it, there are no guarantees. So, oh, we'll be together, we'll be together, be together forever. But you don't know that. Even people who get married can't always stay together. And so if we engage in physical intimacy, we have a bond here that we need to break. We have a bond here that we need to break. We have a bond here that we need to break. And we wind up getting married with a broken heart. How can it weaken intimacy? Well, simply put, ladies, if your husband to be had sex before you, how do you know that he won't have sex after you're married? You see? If he cannot prove his integrity as a single man, if that is not important to him, how do you know that just because he's married to you that he will be able to have the integrity and the power <coughs> to remain faithful? Premature intimacy, even including emotional closeness, can cause a chain reaction of scarring. So in other words, once you've gone past a certain line sexually or even emotionally, it's very, very, very easy to go past that line again, right? Usually, the patterns of physical intimacy do not go from more to less, right? You hold hands. And then after that, holding hands isn't good enough, and so, you, so a little kiss on the cheek. And then kissing on the cheek is not good enough, then you got to kiss on the lips. And then kissing on the lips isn't good enough, you got to spin, you know, nice long make-out section, session, right? And it goes further and further and further, right? That's how it goes. That's how it's designed to go. And in a marriage relationship, that's great because it bonds, it binds, it fuses two people together. But, if there is no marriage, then what happens? You have two wounded people. You have two deeply scarred and deeply hurt and deeply wounded people. And when they get into another relationship, the hurt and the ache is so great, very quickly, you see, you go to the physical. You go to the sexual to stop the pain. And once you've done it, you want it again. It's so much easier. And it can create a chain reaction. A chain reaction of breaking hearts. Past mistakes, however, do not mean that finding true love is hopeless. Even if we have gone too far, even if we have made mistakes, even if we, you know what God is all about? Forgiveness. God is about forgiveness. He is about second chances. He is about wholeness. He is about healing. That's what God does. That's what he measures in. But it requires us to do things God's way now. If you happen to be in an unhealthy relationship where sex is involved, or sexual activity is involved, choose God now. One time Jesus sat down at a well and there was this woman that came up to draw water and he prophetically saw into her. He looked in her eyes and she, he knew, he knew that she had been unfaithful. 
In fact, she has had five men with which she had been intimate, and the man that currently she was having a relationship with was not her husband. Jesus knew this and he talked to her. And what did he say to her? He said, your emptiness can only be filled by me. I am the fount of living water. But go your way and sin no more. You see? She said, the guy you're with now is a bad habit. Drop him and walk away. You understand? That's what Jesus said. Go your way and sin no more. It is possible. God is the redeemer of broken lives. And he can offer healing for damaged emotions. He can offer healing for past baggage. He can offer healing if you and I have gone. The popular term, finding true love, I believe, is very deceptive. You can't find true love. <laughs> no pun intended. Love is made. Yeah. Yeah. You make love, right? Love is made, not found. Does that make sense? Love requires effort. Love requires self-sacrifice. Love requires work. As well as pre-existing compatibility. And I believe part of the problem with the reason that we have so much divorce, people falling out of love. You see, you hear about that, right? I wasn't, I just wasn't happy anymore. I felt we fell into love and we just fell out of love. So we knew that it had run its course. Well, that's a very passive philosophy of love, isn't it? I stumbled into love. We fell out of love. Okay, let's call it quits. But true biblical love is not that way. It's not something that just kind of happens. It's something you work at. It's something you invest in. It's something that you strive for. It's something that you need God and the Holy Spirit inside you to help you do. It is being like Jesus in the life of another person. It is made, it is forged, it is built, it is established. Forgiveness is available. Healing is accessible. Purity is attainable. Even if you and I have blown it, we can start now. Living a life of purity. And love is capable. Amen. Peter says love covers a multitude of sin. Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? No matter what we've done, no matter how many times, you know what? Love can forgive and heal. Adam and Eve didn't have to worry about a lot of the things new couples worry about today. For example, embarrassment with exes, yeah. right? Oh, you know, Adam and Eve never had to go to the mall and then accidentally bump into Adam's old girlfriend, right? How awkward is that? Yeah, that's very awkward, right? Oh, gosh, you know, it's like, oh, man. Oh, you know, she's over there, I see her. I'm going to pretend I don't see her, right? <laughs> honey, honey, let's just go this way, right? <laughs> No, we don't need, we don't need, we don't need, we don't need uh, milk anymore. You know, we don't need to walk down that aisle, right? Because in reality, my old girlfriend's over there and I don't want them to meet, right? STDs and AIDS, of course. Hey, all it takes is one time. I remember reading a story about a girl who had been chased all her life. A girl who had uh, grown up, I, I think maybe grown up in the Catholic Church, and she was pure and she was chaste. But just one time, just one time, she wanted to party like everybody else. And she went out on spring break, and she went to the Caribbean or whatever, you know, something, and just got drunk, and she partied, and she had sex with a Rastafarian, whatever, you know, you know, those, and, you know, wild, you know, and that's all it took. She came back with AIDS. Wow. One time. Reputations. 
how they compare to former lovers. Now, this is a tough one. If you've had sex before marriage, if your wife's had sex before marriage, you're always going to worry. How did I do? Was I better than your ex-football player boyfriend? Oh, he's a lot taller than me. He's like, you know, ah, oh, to eat you up, right? Every man is different. Every woman is different. And some, sometimes guys think, well, no, no, I want to have a lot of sexual experience. You know? That would make me more satisfied during marriage. No, actually, it does the opposite. It does the opposite. Why? Every woman is different. Every woman is an individual and has some things that are wonderful and some things that, you know, you can't compare objectively. Because if you compare objectively, guess what? Well, this one had softer skin, and that one had more shapely legs, and well, this one had, you understand? And what's going to happen, instead of being more fulfilled, you will be less fulfilled in marriage. Because we will be always comparing. Secrets, memories, milestones. How many first times do you get? By definition, what? Of course. What? And it doesn't even have to be like really sexual. It can be, you know how it is. When you're, when you're with someone and you're like, oh, remember that restaurant? Okay. It's like we discovered that restaurant together. Wow, and then you have these wonderful memories, right? Or oh, remember that tree, you know? I first told you I loved you under that tree. Yeah. Remember that pond? You know, we walked by the pond and we fed the ducks. You know, even those little sentimental, sweet little things. You know what? How many of those do you want to share? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, every girl I dated, I take her by that pond, you know? I... It cheapens it. It's not as special. It's not as sweet. It's not as precious. As you're dating, aim for marriage. Okay? As we're dating, aim for marriage. To stand at that altar.
Um, go ahead, everybody. Everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes. Bow your heads. The first step in all of this, the pre basic presupposition is what? Is that we are all followers of Jesus. We are all children of God. If you and I are indeed children of God, of course God provides for his children. In ancient times, it was the responsibility of the parents to find husbands for their daughters or find wives for their sons, right? It was the job of the parent to hook you up. God, as your heavenly parent, wants to hook you up. But maybe in this room, maybe there are some of us here who have not yet been adopted into God's family. Maybe there are a couple of us who have never really accepted Jesus Christ into your heart and don't know for certain if you are God's child or not. I want to give you an opportunity. I don't want to just assume that you're a Christian and just gloss over this. So I want to ask you, if you have never formally accepted Jesus Christ into your heart so that you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are God's child, would you pray this prayer with me? I'm going to pray this prayer and you can whisper it after me or you can just say it silently in your heart and you can know that God is your Father. Would you do this? Just repeat after me right now. Dear God, dear God, I want to be your child. I open the door of my heart. Ask Jesus to come in to forgive me, to wash me clean, and to give me a new start as your child. I believe that you have taken all of my sin and my guilt and placed it upon Jesus, that he has died, that he was raised from the dead, and I believe that he has paid the price for all of my sins, past, present, and future. I thank you that according to your promise, you have come into my life and you promise to prepare a place for me with you in heaven forever. I am now and forever your beloved child. Don't don't open your eyes yet. Keep your heads, uh, heads bowed, eyes closed. If you happen to have said that, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm gonna, not going to make you stand up. I'm not going to make you walk forward. I, I just want to know so that I can pray for you. And no one's going to see you. No one's going to look except for maybe Pastor Jonathan. Pastor Jonathan is the only one. If by chance you said that prayer, could you raise your hand? We're not going to embarrass you. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Praise God. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Don't be afraid. I'm not going to embarrass you. Very good. Congratulations. You are now children of God. Congratulations. That is so awesome. Welcome to the family. Now, here's one for the rest of us. If you are a single person, and you would like to say, you know what? This makes sense to me. I never thought about it this way. I've always been in control of my social life. But you know what? That blows. I want God to be in control of my dating life. I want to do things His way. I, I, you know what? I am going to do it Adam's way. All right? I'm going to trust God with my sexuality. I'm going to trust God with my relationships. I'm going to trust God with my dating. And I want God to be my father and to, to, to find the right one for me and make me the right one for him or for her. If that expresses the desire of your heart, would you stand up right now? You should stand up as a single person and you stand up and we will pray together. Okay, anyone?
Very good. Anyone else? Anyone else? Just raise your hand or stand up. We will pray together. You can't be too young. You can't be too young and you can't be too old. As long as you're single. Like I said, if you're married, um, <laughs> don't go out and say, okay, honey, uh, I'm going to go out and date some more. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Very good. Let's pray. Dear God, here I am, and I want you to be in control of my life, especially my dating life. And God, I want you to find me the right person and to make me the right person. Help me right away to start doing your work here on earth so that I will grow, I will develop maturity, I will become a better person, and I can prepare myself for that wonderful, wonderful person you will prepare for me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, I, Francis, I'm coming back uh, next month or something. Uh, October 20th. Very good, very good. So I'm looking forward, okay, looking forward to seeing you guys again. All right, and um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Pastor Jim. And uh, we're just going to close it out with some songs.
extend a special welcome to all the first time visitors who are here tonight. Um, we've been doing this about three months now. It's, we call it our young adult worship, but it's open to everyone, so if you enjoyed it, please feel free to come again no matter your age. Um, we meet uh, usually about three times, the first three Fridays of the month. Uh, the fourth Friday, we usually do a community service event. Um, last Friday, we went to visit Alwyn's uh, grandma in the nursing home. She really liked my kids. So that was really fun. Um, but yeah, uh, we have refreshments after this, and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, first three Fridays of every month we're here. Uh, fourth Friday, community service event. And if it's a fifth Friday, uh, we usually do a hangout of some sort and go out. So uh, that's it. Uh, we're all dismissed. We got refreshments downstairs. Uh, drinks.